interesting concept uh, called pattern matching, which uh, I wish more front-end developers uh, were familiar with. Um, and so um, pattern matching is a way of writing declarative code branching. It's actually not that complicated, uh, but uh, it's implemented in a, in a variety of languages but it's not implemented in, in, uh, in TypeScript and in JavaScript. And I think it's too bad because in my opinion, pattern matching really uh, makes us write code that is more uh, readable and easier to, to maintain, update. Um, and that's why around a year ago, I started working on a, on a pattern matching library for, for TypeScript in my spare time called TS Pattern. Um, and I really tried to, to focus on uh, usability and type safety. And um, and so during this talk, I, I try to 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 um, to familiar uh, to make you familiar with the concept of pattern matching, and I'll give you a quick demo of the of the library I built, and uh, I'll try to show you why I think it's it could uh, improve a lot of the code we write every way, every day in the front end. But uh, in order to get there, I first need to give you a quick uh, introduction introduction and a quick overview of the front end ecosystem and the challenges uh, we are facing today. So I start by saying that the front-end ecosystem is becoming increasingly declarative. So the first uh, big framework that really uh, started talking about declarative programming for the front-end was React. Um, the, the goal, um, well, the, the goal of React is to make it easy to build UIs. Uh, and uh, by uh, using declarative programming, it showed us that it's much easier to actually uh, like declare what your UI should look like for a given state, than imperatively manipulating the DOM directly uh, to to uh, like to to make it uh, look like what you want it to, do, to look like. And um, this idea has really caught up in the front end ecosystem. And today, a lot of uh, other UI library aim to be declarative. Uh, and it's not only the UI library; a lot of state management library as well claim to be declarative. So, what exactly does that mean? So the idea of declarative programming is actually pretty simple. It's the, the fact of splitting your logic into different steps. Uh, the first step is the declaration. And the idea is to uh, describe what you want to happen uh, by creating data structures. And the second step is the interpretation, where we write some code that will traverse these data structures to produce some side effects. So for instance, in React, we decry uh, how the UI should look like using JSX. And then we let React interpret this description by going through the JSX um, template and, uh, and actually mutating the DOM in a performant way. So your app specific logic lives on the declarative side and uh, the app agnostic one, the library lives on the, the imperative interpreter. So why, why do we do that? So declarative pro programming has a number of benefits. Uh, the first one is that the code that we write uh, is more concise. And that's because the, re the repetitive part uh, has been abstracted away inside the interpreter. Um, also, since the declaration is kind of a domain restricted language, a uh, domain specific language, uh, the, the domain is restrained. And that means that there are fewer things we can do. And so there are fewer mistakes we can make and that leads to less bugs. And another, another good, uh, good side of declarative programming is that it, the, our business logic uh, essentially becomes side effects free. And so that's great because it means that it's easier to test, it's easier to reason about it, to update it. And usually the performance trade-off, uh, which is uh, associated with uh, splitting your logic in two steps is, uh, is acceptable. But um, if I'm here today is to argue uh, that uh, there, there are a piece of the puzzle that we are still missing in the front-end ecosystem, and that's declarative code branching. And I think it's a big deal because code branching is uh, an, essential, an essential part of the complexity of uh, the code we, we write every day. So uh, what are the options we have in TypeScript today for code branching? So we actually have three options, the switch statement, the if and the else statement, and the ternary operator. So let's start with the switch statement. So I'm going to use React uh, for my examples today because that's that's the framework I'm the most familiar with, but the ideas apply uh, more broadly. Um, so switch statement. So if you have used React, you, you probably noticed that using the switch statement uh, inside React is not straightforward. 
um, you cannot use it inside of your JSX template like this. Oh, the only way to do that is to actually wrap your switch statement inside an immediately invoked function like this one. Uh, and that's because uh, statements do don't return any value. Um, and since we are describing or like creating this description, we want, we need values. And that's why statements is not uh, really a good fit for a declarative context. What we need uh, instead are expressions which are pieces of code that uh, does evaluate to, to values. Um, another downside of the switch statement is that you can only branch on a single value at a time. So here, for instance, uh, I have this user object, uh, this user type, which can either be anonymous or authenticated. And if it's authenticated, it's either an administrator or a contributor. And what I would like to do is to um, display some UI conditionally based on these two properties, on the type property and on the role property. But with a switch statement, since, since I can only look at a single property at a time, I, I, the only option I have is to nest switch statements together. And I still need to wrap them in, a, in this immediately invoked, in, invoked function. So that's not great. So what about the if and the else statement? So we, with them, we can uh, check several values at the same time. Uh, this is the same example, but here our code branching is, is pretty flat. And that's because we can combine uh, checks using Boolean operators li like this. But it still doesn't fit super well in a declarative context. As you can see, we still need this, uh, this, this function in order to put that here. Um, and another issue uh, I, I, I found to statements is that uh, this kind of code tends to evolve badly over time. And that's because each statement is implicitly related to one another. So what I mean by, by that is that here I'm defining this JSX variable and then I'm conditionally assigning, assigning it. Um, and nothing stops me from writing something completely unrelated in between these two statements. And so you, you might be thinking, why, why the hell would I do that? And the, the, the answer is that it's actually a bit more subtle than, than that. When you work on big code bases with a lot of collaborators, um, sometimes it's not super easy to, to see the, the intent of the code and you just want to, to, to add something, to add some behavior. And you, you can write this kind of um, unrelated thing without noticing that uh, you are breaking uh, two different things that were related apart. Um, and maybe later somebody uh, needs to make an HTTP request if the user is authenticated and uh, he puts that here because that seems to make sense. But we end up with this complex code, which doesn't really reflect the initial intent, which was to conditionally assign a variable to a value. So that's not great. So luckily, we have another option. We have ternaries, which are expressions. Uh, and um, so it's, it's a concise way to conditionally assign a variable to something. Um, and that, that's great because since it's a single block, uh, it's, we are less likely to add un unrelated things inside of this block. Um, so we'll probably end up with some code that looks like this where each concern is, uh, is separated, which is better. But the issue with Tanner is that they don't scale very well. Um, when you need several branches, you need to nest your Tanneries and you, you have uh, this kind of code that is not very easy to read. And uh, there are other downsides, like uh, it's hard to assign a variable. Like, actually, you cannot assign a variable inside one of your branch to, to reuse it uh, because you are in this expression. And there is also another thing is that I always need to return a value for the else case. And in this case, let's say a value that type uh, is a known thing. And I know that uh, it's either A, B, C, D, E, uh, F, or G. Um, I really don't want to have to, to return something in the other case because I, I know that it's never going to happen. So what I would like instead is uh, have TypeScript check that I'm on the other cases properly. And, um, and, and yeah, I shouldn't have to, to provide this new value. And so this concept of making the compiler uh, enforced that we are handling all the possible cases is called exhaustiveness checking. Um, there are several ways to do that in TypeScript, and here is one. Uh, so here you can see that we are defining this exhaustive function at the top of, the, of this, uh, this file. 
and it doesn't do anything, but it takes a parameter of type never. Now, the, the never type in TypeScript um, uh, is not something we can create with a value. It's actually a type that we, a TypeScript will infer if a code path is unreachable. So here I have this fetch state object and uh, it can be either loading success or error. And since I'm handling all of these cases, uh, TypeScript knows that the default case will never happen. So it, it, it will uh, give the never type to this fetch state object, which means that I can pass it to the exhaustive function. And if I am commenting one of the case out, so if I'm not handling everything, uh, the fetch state type here will be the remaining case, which is error in this case. And I cannot pass that to my exhaustive function. So um, I basically made TypeScript tell me that I was not uh, handling all the cases properly. So that's a very helpful trick, um, especially on big code bases with a lot of collaborators. Um, but it, it only works with switch statements. And um, as we said earlier, it has a lot of uh, downsides. So to sum up, um, we have no built-in option that is an expression that let us branch on several value at a time and that supports exhaustive checking. And that brings me to pattern matching. So um, pattern matching is essentially uh, a way of writing declarative code branching. So it's a language feature and it's implemented in a lot of, uh, in a lot of languages. Um, it's coming from functional programming languages like Haskell, Erlang, or Camel initially, but it's slowly making its way into main, uh, uh, into uh, mainstream languages like uh, Rust or Swift or Elixir. And on the front end, we also have some languages that compile to JavaScript, like uh, RustScript or PureScript that support pattern matching. <clears throat> and so the big idea of pattern matching is that instead of converting the input uh, data structure into a Boolean and using it inside the if statement, <clears throat> we are going to define uh, the shape of the input that, uh, that, we, that we want. And the, if the input matches this shape, then we will execute this, uh, this uh, branch of code. So this shape is called the pattern. And um, we actually have a, a proposal, a TC39 proposal to add pattern matching to TypeScript. Um, so here is uh, how it looks. Um, so on the left, uh, we have uh, uh, our usual if and else uh, statements. On the right, we have the same code using pattern matching. So as you can see, the first thing you can notice that the, the pattern matching code is an expression. So you can assign it to a value. Here I'm assigning it to the JSX constant. Um, so it starts with this case keyword, and then uh, we give it the, the fetch state object. And we are going to pattern match on that. And then we have a bunch of branches and they all start with this when keyword. So the first thing that follows the when keyword is the pattern. And so this is the, the shape we, we want the value to have to execute this branch. So here, if fetch state uh, is an object with a status property, which is equal to loading, then we will execute uh, and return whatever this branch returns. And if the status is success and we have data properties, then we are going to be able to use the data property inside of our code branch. So um, I, I feel like it's much more readable because it just looks like uh, what you expect, uh, what you expect your value to be. So it's kind of hacking our natural ability to um, to recognize patterns, which is which is really really cool. But the downside is that um, unfortunately I, I'm not, I don't think that it's going to land anytime soon. And I don't think that because uh, this proposal is in, is in a very early stage, um, even though it's been around for, for quite some time now. And that's because it's a complex proposal with a lot of interactions with uh, other language features. And I, also, um, we, we might have it for, for JavaScript, but then we uh, adding that to TypeScript uh, will also be a big lift, in my opinion, because, um, because there are some type inference things that uh, will need to be figured out. Uh, and that's why um, around a year ago, I started working on this side project called TS Pattern, which is a user line implementation for pattern matching, uh, which tries to be as good as native language support, 
in terms of usability and um, type safety. And uh, when I started the project, I, I really didn't know if that was possible to, to do something that would be good enough. But uh, in the end, I'm pretty satisfied with the result. Uh, so you can you can look it up on GitHub if you want. Um, so here is the here is the same code using TS pattern inside uh, instead of the the native language support. And as you can see, it's pretty similar. But the main difference is that we we don't start with a keyword. We start with this match function, and we give it uh, the value we want to match on, and then we we chain a bunch of with methods. And they all take a pattern and a handler function that will be executed if the pattern matches. And it's, it ends with this dot exhaustive method, which does two different things. The first thing is that it would make TypeScript check that we are actually handling all the possible cases in our uh, data structure to, to not have a runtime zero. And it, it's also going to execute the expression and return the actual value. So just to, to give you um, um, a quick uh, intuition about uh, what it is, uh, what it looks like to be using patterns instead of uh, the usual code we write. Um, here are some examples. So patterns can be uh, literal values, like strings, uh, numbers, boolean. And uh, when you use that, it's equivalent to checking that your value is equal to, to, the, to um, the literal. And you can also, in TS pattern, you can uh, put several patterns uh, in, in with. And it essentially means that uh, it's, it's equivalent to using the or boolean operator. But patterns can be much more than that. They can also be objects or any data structure, actually. And if, if, it's, <clears throat> if it's an, obje an object, I'm oh, sorry. So if it's an object, um, we will check that the input value is also an object. And we'll check that each property inside the input matches um, the, the property on the pattern. So here, it will match if um, the input is an object with a code property, which is equal to 200, and a data property, which is an object, which, is, uh, which has a type property, which is equal to text. So it's equivalent to that code. It can also be uh, an array of fixed length, like this one, or uh, a list pattern. So if you, if you uh, create an array and you put a single pattern inside of it, this pattern will be checked against every uh, value inside of your input array in TS pattern. And the nice thing about patterns is that they can be nested. <clears throat> and they can be nested in any way and with any complexity. So it really means that you, you can use patterns for uh, arbitrary complex cases. And uh, as, as the, the cases are more and more complex, you can see that the code uh, for pattern matching is much simpler than the equivalent Boolean logic. And uh, here on this example, I'm also leaving out uh, a lot of uh, things that I, I, I'm actually checking with this pattern that I'm not checking here, like the fact that uh, the first element is an, is an object, the fact that the second element is an object, etc. So we also have special patterns, uh, which are called wildcard patterns. And the, the, the most common one is this underscore underscore pattern, which um, always match, essentially. And it's useful when you are interested in a piece of your data structure, but, but you are not interested in another in another branch of your data structure. So in this case, if I want to match against any array where the second element is a 10 and which is which has a length of two, uh, then I can use this pattern, for instance. And there are also type specific patterns uh, like the underscore underscore dot string and dot number, uh, which uh, will match if the, the name property is a string or the age property is a number. <clears throat> So the, this the, this um, helper is exported by by a TS pattern, and so in the end you get that kind of code, where you can just put directly your match expression inside your JSX uh, uh, markup, and it just works. You and you you don't need to wrap that inside a self invoke uh, function or anything. You, you like it's much cleaner, and um, and you get exhaustive uh, checking by default. So you don't have to write that. You, you can just write this instead, which I think is great. Um, so now I'm going to switch to uh, a quick demo uh, to, to give you a bit more insight of, um, of uh, how it is to, to be using TS pattern in practice. So, um, so we are going to build uh, a, 
a gif fetcher application. So it, it's going to be a very tiny application. And here is the final result. So we ha will have this, uh, this input. And if I type something, I get a list of, uh, of gifs, uh, which I fetch from Giphy. So if I type dog, I get a list of, of dog. And that's, that's pretty much it. So it's not super intimidating. Uh, and we'll see how we can we can write that so using TS patterns. So let's have a look at the code. So the first thing we notice is that we have this this um, state type, which is the the type of the state of our application, and it has two different properties: the query property, which is a string, and the data property, uh, which is a union, and it's either idle, loading, or success. And if it's in the success case, it has a list of gifs, uh, which is a list of strings. Yeah, the list of URLs actually. And there are also uh, events that our application can, can uh, handle. And we have three events for at the moment. We have the search event, the success event, and the console event. So the, the search event is the one uh, that is triggered when I type something in this input. And the success event is uh, the one that is triggered when the HTTP request com comes back and we have some data. And the console event uh, yeah, is triggered when the input is cleared. So then we have this initial state, uh, which is not super interesting. We have a reducer that doesn't do anything yet. So we are going to, 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 to write, write it shortly. And then we have this component. Um, and so let's have a look at the UI first. So you, it's very simple. We have this input and every time uh, the, um, the value changes, we are dispatching the search event with the, the content of the input as a query. Um, and we are currently just displaying the, the, the JSON uh, data directly inside our container. So let's, um, ah, we also have this use effect uh, hook, which uh, is triggered every time the state uh, dot query changes. And it's going to, so currently it's not fetching anything, but uh, it's going to fetch some data and, uh, and return some results. And we are going to, um, to dispatch the success action when we get the result. So let's start by uh, implementing this reducer. So as you have guessed, uh, we are going to use this pattern for that. So we, we start by um, calling the match function on the event. The first thing I'm going to do is to end uh, the expression with the dot exhaustive uh, function. And um, obviously it's not working uh, and TypeScript is telling me that I'm not handling all the cases. Uh, that's because I'm, I'm not handling any cases at the moment. So let's uh, let's fix that by by adding the first with uh, method. So the first case we are going to handle is the search event. So as you can see, uh, TypeScript is uh, is very helpful. It, it's providing me with uh, some some nice auto completion when I write the pattern, which is great. Uh, and I'm going to define a handler, and I'm going to return a new state, um, which we have some query, so I'm going to update the query, which I get inside the event. Um, and I'm going to assign data to loading status. Um, okay, and so um, the, the thing I need to do is that I need to extract the query property from, from my event. So how do I, how do, I do that? So let's have a look at what we get inside the handler parameter. And we, we get an object with type search and a, query and a string query property. And that's actually uh, the type of event which has been narrowed by our pattern. So um, basically, we, we get the, the same object, but the type is different. And the type, the type is uh, restricted to what the, the pattern actually uh, permits. So here we have the query, so we can just extract it and use it in, uh, in our handler. And so that, that's nice, and, but we can see that uh, TypeScript is still complaining. Uh, and that's because we're not handling all the cases, but it's not only complaining, it's also telling us what are the cases that are missing. And so here we are missing the success case and the console case. So let's fix that by, by adding uh, some other features. So on console, uh, just going to, to update the data and set it to idle. And on success, I'm going to extract 
um, the GIF URLs, and I'm going to set the state to success, and I'll pass the GIF URL here. So I'm also going to, to uh, force the type uh, to event and state. So this is the um, um, th this is the uh, the input type of the match expression, and this is the output type of the mat mat uh, match expression. I usually don't need to specify them, but in this case, uh, it's it's uh, better than having a big error because if I specify them, TypeScript is able to tell me exactly what is going wrong. And what's going wrong is that I don't have any query uh, um, variable in scope, so I, I just need to do that instead. We have a reducer, so let's have a look. So if I type something on the right side, you can see that uh, I briefly am in the loading state, and then uh, I'm in the success state. The peers input, I re return to the full state. This is what we want. So now let's update the, the DOM and I display something more interesting there than the JSON dump. Um, so I'm going to match on state.data this time. I'm calling exhaustive right away, and then I add some uh, handler functions. So the first case I'm going to handle is the idle state. So it's status idle, and uh, in this case I'm going to um, I'm just going to return uh, a H1 with idle in it. Uh, and that, that's it for now. And so, um, as we can see, our application doesn't compile uh, yet. Uh, we also need to handle the user cases as usual. So let's add some branches for, for them. So in, in the loading state, I'm just going to display the loading. And if I'm this, in the success state, I'm going to extract the GIF URLs, so using TypeScript the completion again. And I'm going to display fetch success, and I'll map over the, the list of URLs to return an image tag uh, with uh, our URL. So I also need to provide a key in uh, in uh, in React to avoid having uh, some warnings, and I'll tag. So here we are. So let's try it. If I type cat, I get a, a gif of a cat, so that's great. And if I type dog, I still get a, a gif of a cat. And that's because I, I didn't implement the, the data fetching logic yet. So you might have noticed that something that our application doesn't do yet is handling errors correctly. And um, that's not great because if I if my promise rejects, let's say I'm rejecting with a new error. Uh, saying, oh, um, yeah, my 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 uh, my code my code doesn't handle that, so I get uh, this big error message. So I need to do something. And what I need to do uh, is to add a catch method here. And uh, I I'd like to display a new kind of uh, to dispatch sorry a new kind of event, which will be the error type. Currently, it doesn't exist, but uh, we are going to 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 create it uh, right now. So let's add a new error event in our list of events. Playing an error property. An error. Right. And so the first thing we see is that um, TypeScript is not happy. We have uh, our exhaustive uh, exhaustive uh, method that is yelling at us, and that's because we are not. So <clears throat> I can just let uh, TypeScript tell me what I need to do next. I just need to handle uh, the error case, and what I'm going to do is to assign uh, data to a new status, which is error. And it doesn't exist yet, so I also need to create it in the type. So it's essentially the same effect. Now with status equal to error and an error, which is an error. And uh, now it's the, the rendering uh, match expression that doesn't compile. So let's add the code branch for the error case. 
In this case, we are going to display the error message in a p tag. It's not the greatest UI, UI you have ever seen, but uh, it works. So let's see if it actually works. <laughs> And it, it does. So, so we, we can see that we are handling the fetch error properly. So now we are ready to switch to uh, the actual Giphy API. So let's do that. So before the, the talk, I, I already prepared this search diff function that doesn't do anything interesting except uh, fetching some, some uh, GIF URL from Giphy using the query. And so uh, I'm just putting that here and let's see if that works. So if I type cat, I get pictures of cats. If I type dog, pictures of dogs. But as you can see, there is still a bug. Uh, when I wh while I'm typing, uh, I get a lot of responses. Of queries I've made every time I made a quiz talk, um, and that's not a, good, a great user experience. So one way to fix that is to uh, cancel the previous promise. But here I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to to handle that inside my reducer. And what I, what I really want to do is to not switch to the success state or the error state if the, um, the success event is not the same, is not the event that corresponds to the query I have in my state, right? And so what I need to do is to first add a new query property, which will be a string, to the success and error events. And we are going to essentially use them as uh, an ID to, to know what query this data uh, is for. So we, we just do that. And here we, are, we need to set the query property. Um, and now what I can do is I can, uh, I can make this pattern a bit more complex by checking the query property as well. So I want the query property of my event to be equal to the state.query, right? And I want to do that for the, the error as well. So essentially what I'm saying is that um, the, the event must be of type success and has a query which is equal to state.query. And we see that uh, our exhaustive uh, method is yelling at us again. And that's because we are not handling uh, every cases anymore. And that, that's, that's right, that's correct. Uh, we are not handling all the success events that, where the query doesn't match. Let's handle them. So we could handle them uh, just like we, we did before by uh, just uh, creating a new method and, and, um, and just returning the, the current state in this case and do the same thing for error. That would work. But we actually have a better option. We can use the, the underscore underscore pattern, which I presented in my talk, which matches anything. And we need to import it. And now uh, we can see that our application compiles again. So actually the exhaustive method is not super useful here because since I'm, I'm handling everything here, uh, it can only be exhaustive. So since it's a pretty common case, there is um, uh, a shorthand notation for that which is the otherwise method. Essentially doing what we were doing previously, but. So now let's have a look. If I type hello there, and see that uh, I get a single result, which is much better. And I, I'm not uh, having this UI that was flickering before. So that's great. And let's type something a bit longer. And you can see that if, I, if I, we have no results in the response, uh, we end up in this state where we have this fetch success, but we cannot see anything. <clears throat> so wh what we would like to do instead is probably to display a no result message. So we could do, th do, that, do that here by uh, checking the, the array.lamp property and uh, using a ternary and displaying no result here. That would work fine, as you can see. But since we are using pattern matching, we don't actually don't need to nest several uh, levels of, uh, of code branching like this. We can do everything on the same level. Let's do that instead. We are just going to write a new branch. We are going to, to pattern match on the status success and give URLs uh, equal to an empty. 
it need to download results. I'm not really using the ERA anymore, so I can remove it. And let's have a look at what happens. And it does work. So uh, we have we have seen a lot of things. So let me sum up uh, very very quickly. So the first thing that we notice is that um, the pattern matching expression really fits well in the declarative context. We don't have to do anything special. We can just put uh, put our expression directly inside our JSX tag, which is nice. Um, we have seen that uh, exhaustive checking is really helpful and it really helps us and guide us uh, in the process of developing new features. Uh, we have seen that we can make complex uh, patterns um, that check several values at the same time. And uh, if I have still some time, I, I'd like to quickly show you another interesting thing you can do with pattern matching. So let's have a look at the search GIF uh, function. And um, and so le let's see what it does. So it's uh, it's essentially a wrapper around the fetch uh, method that exists on the API. And we are just fetching some data from the GIF API, the GIF API. Giffy, Giffy, I don't know. And um, when uh, and so what, what I get in response is something of type any. So what, what that means is that I, I actually don't know what this is. And so what I could do is to uh, force cast it to the type I'm expecting and that the documentation is telling me uh, the API will return. <clears throat> but um, if the API changes, if a backend developer makes a, a change, then my code would be broken. So what I can do instead is, is, is that. So I can pattern match on this any value and check that it, it, uh, it, it, it has this shape, which is what I'm expecting from the Giphy API. And then I can look at the value with the type uh, narrowed to what my pattern permits. And I can see that uh, I get the type of the pattern essentially. And here I can just uh, write some type safe code and get, extract the list of URL out of the, the data object. And if my pattern doesn't match, I'm just going to throw in that the pattern does not match. And that's great because since I'm handling the error um, explicitly, I know that my application is going to handle that correctly. So for instance, if I made a mistake and instead of images, I thought the API was going to return image um, and I tried to search for pictures of cats, I end up with this error, which is, uh, which means that our application handles that gracefully. And if I change that back to images, I get back the, the, the list of uh, images. So that's pretty much everything I wanted to show you during the demo. So let me get back to my slides. Um, yeah, so to sum up, um, yeah, I, I think that uh, that, uh, that um, a lot of the complexity we write uh, in our day-to-day -day life as uh, front-end software engineers come from code branching. And uh, I don't think we have the right uh, set of uh, tools to handle uh, code branching uh, properly. And I think that pattern matching is actually a great tool because it nudges us towards writing code that is safer, more readable, easier to update, to add new uh, cases or to remove some. And so th that, that's why I think that's great. And uh, the TS pattern library is uh, kind of my humble attempt to make this concept more mainstream in the TypeScript community. And so uh, I released the version three of this library uh, a few months ago, and it's the first long time supported version of the library. So feel free to, to use it um, and to, to send me feedbacks uh, uh, either on the, uh, on Twitter or on GitHub on opening issues. And if you want to have uh, essentially the text version of this talk, you can uh, Google bring pattern matching to TypeScript and you will probably find uh, this blog post which uh, has essentially the same content as what, uh, what I, I just told you. So thanks, uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, you can find me on, uh, on GitHub at gvernio and on Twitter at Gabriel Vernio. And that's that was it. Cool. Thanks, Gabriel.
Yeah, you're welcome. It was awesome, I think, also for the audience.